All right, let's get started on uh, the male reproductive system right here. And with the male reproductive system, uh, when we start looking at the male and the female reproductive system, like I mentioned in class yesterday, it is all to increase the probability of having uh, <clears throat> of fertilization and then carrying the baby to live birth. So when we think about all the things that are going to occur in the male reproductive system and then coincide it with what's occurring every month in the female reproductive system, you can see how at certain times there's going to be markedly increased probability of having uh, fertilization and then having obviously a baby develop from it. So it's pretty cool how the timing actually works. So as we look at it right here in uh, slide 28.1 right here, just understand just the general functions, right? We're gonna talk about each one specifically, but it kind of makes sense. One of the functions is produce gametes. Gametes are the sperm cells of males, oocytes in females. So the gametes are the actual cells that we'll need to fertilize. So then we can have, hopefully, the baby develop in utero. But, whoops, that did not work out well. Uh, just keep in mind that, you know, we'll talk more about each one of these functions specifically. So a couple of things about the male reproductive system, just in general, and how the anatomy here really, really affects the physiology. The first thing you have to understand is for males to produce viable sperm, the testes where the actual sperm production occurs needs to be cooler than body temperature. So in order to make it cooler than body temperature, we are going to need to thermoregulate. One of the things that allows us to thermoregulate are, are these two muscles right here. One called the dartos, one called the cremaster muscle. The dartos muscle is just the area of the scrotum where there's a little bit of muscle. And I use an analogy between this muscle and the platysma in our neck. Now, last semester in 201, you guys should have talked or discussed a little bit or even just viewed the muscle called the platysma. The platysma is a very superficial muscle. It is basically embedded on the subcutaneous tissue of the, you know, the skin of your neck. And usually every single model that we have that shows the neck, that shows musculature of the neck, that shows the cardiovascular vessels of the neck, has the platysma already removed. The reason for it is just by removing the skin and visualizing the muscles of the neck, we remove the platysma. It is very superficial. And that's very similar to what the dartos muscle is like. The dartos muscle is very superficial. And the dartos muscle is gonna be found on the subcutaneous tissue of the scrotum. And the main purpose is to thermoregulate. When it's hot out, the dartos muscles relax, allowing the, allowing the testes to dissipate heat away. When it's cold out, the dartos muscle contracts, shriveling up the testes. So then the shriveling up the testes, and then along with the cremaster muscle, it allows you to move the testes closer to the hip inguinal region of your body right here. So then you can warm up the testes. Remember, we don't want cold temperature. We want slightly cool temperature. Now the cremaster muscle is gonna be found as part of the spermatic cord and that cremaster muscle allows you to elevate or depress the testes. The cremaster muscle is going to relax when it's very hot out and what happens, or even after hot shower. This is one of the reasons why we do have teenagers, uh, young adults up until about 20, 25 do a lot of testicular exams after a hot shower. After a hot shower, the <clears throat> core body temperature increases. And what we need to do then is somehow move the testes away from the core body. So then we don't have increased heat develop in the testes. So how do we do this? We relax the cremaster muscle, allowing the testes to descend. And then along with the relaxation of the dartos, Right, the relaxation of the dartos allows the skin of the scrotum to relax. So then there's more surface area to dissipate heat. Now, when it's cold, the opposite occurs. Cremaster muscle contracts, elevating the testes closer towards the inguinal region. 
of the body where it's nice and warm. Along with the dart toast, the dart toast shrivels the skin, so can't, you can't radiate heat away from the testes. It allows you then to warm up the testes when it's cold. We're gonna see later on as well that even blood needs to be cooled before it enters the area of the testes. So thermal regulation, incredibly important to form viable sperm. Now the testes, and we're gonna see, testes and ovaries are very similar, especially during just before gestation, right? Before uh, you know puberty, what we're gonna see is that the testes and ovaries and even the fallopian tubes and the seminifer the vas deferens are gonna be very similar in terms of their size. So what I want you to understand is before puberty, there's a lot of similarities in terms of the shape, in terms of the patterning that we see in the testes and even the fallopian tubes. Now, testes itself though, one big difference is when we cut the testes, we will notice that it's going to be divided into compartments that we call lobes. The lobules or the inside each compartment, you're gonna have these seminiferous tubules. And I want, you, I want you to imagine this is just like a very convoluted hosing system. Within the hose, like your garden hose, you're gonna have an opening where the water's gonna go through, that lumen. Well, within the seminiferous tubules, just like in a garden hose, you're gonna have an opening in the middle instead of water going through it, like in a garden hose, where sperm is gonna develop. As they develop, they develop from outside end of the seminiferous tubule, and then they migrate towards the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. And it allows us to have the my meiosis and then have sperm development. And then the developed sperm at this point, it's not fully mature yet, but it is somewhat functional, right? The sperm then gets moved through the lumen from the seminiferous tubules, through the ductal rectus, right? And the ready testes. And then it's gonna migrate into the epididymis region where then it's going to fully mature. Now, in the seminiferous tubule, this is where the meiosis and meiotic events occurred that we talked about yesterday. I do have a separate video just on my meiosis. So I'm not gonna talk too much about it today. So what I want you to understand is, you have this garden hose-like seminiferous tubules that is going to be folded many, many times. And within the outer end, the plastic part, if you wanna imagine, of a garden hose, that plastic part that makes up the garden hose is going to be the seminiferous tubules. And that's where meiosis occurs. Meiosis occurs so that we can produce immature sperm cells. The sperm cells then are going to migrate through the seminiferous tubules into the ready testes and into the epididymis. And the epididymis then is going to get a functional flagellum. It's going to get a functional acrosome. And then it's going to then increase the mitochondria there. So then the sperm cells are now capable of doing a lot of amazing things, going up into the uterus, up into the fallopian tubes, and then eventually fertilizing an egg. Now, the testes itself, if you're touching the testes for a testicular exam and you're palpating it, it should be smooth. If there are any bumps at all in testes, automatically that's a tumor. And that's something we need to really be careful about. Now, in terms of the covering of the testes, the outer covering, that's the white sheathing that covers it, is called the tunica albigenia. This tunica albigenia, right, then penetrates, it's a thick white connective tissue, penetrates the testes to divide it into lobes. Within the lobes, you have some nephrous tubules and cells that are found outside of the seminiferous tubules that we call interstitial cells, sometimes called Leydig cells. They're gonna be important coming up because they secrete testosterone. Now, the scent of testes, and keep in mind, right? Like I mentioned the other time, and I'll probably mention a few more times. When testes are first developing, when you're first conceived, you'll either have testes or ovaries based on your XY patterning. If you're a male, you're XY and you're gonna have testes. 
You have female, you're gonna be XX, you can have ovaries. Now, this has nothing to do with any, right, kind of uh, any gender association or identification. We're talking strictly about biology here. And in a biological sense, if you're XY, obviously you're gonna have testes. If you're XY, there's no way you're gonna have ovaries that can develop. So what happens is when we have a three month old baby fetus right here, so baby in utero. So we're talking about just at the very end of the first trimester. What we're gonna see is that the testes have developed. That doesn't mean they're functional though. There's no sperm in the testes. So these testes that develop are retroperitoneal. They're behind the peritoneal cavity and they're next to the actual kidneys. That's how high up in the back we are. So we're near that first lumbar vertebrae, last thoracic vertebrae region. So it's pretty high up into your abdomen. So what we're gonna see is, and not only is it high up, it's very lateral and it's very far back in terms of being retroperitoneal. Remember the peritoneum is an external covering that covers the inside of your abdominal cavity. So in the anterior peritoneum, you can have the transverse abdominus muscle. Well, you can have the lining of the transverse abdominal having a nice serous connective tissue that we call the peritoneum. The peritoneum moves towards the back. And then the thing is, there are organs back here that are retroperitoneal, meaning they're behind this region, behind the peritoneal covering of the abdomen. If they're behind the peritoneal covering of the abdomen, they're really far back. So for the testes to descend, which starts at the end of the first trimester, the testes not only have to move down into the scrotum, it has to move from lateral to medial. It has to move forward, then medially, then down into the scrotal sac. So there's a lot of room for issues that can develop because you have to move in so many different directions. So here, to increase the probability that we do have some kind of, you know, a lead so that we can have the testes follow a path down, right? We have the gubernaculum right here. The gubernaculum right here is going to guide the testes on its way from areas near the kidneys. It's gonna move it forward. Then it's gonna move it medially and then inferiorly. So then it can go into the scrotal swelling. And the process here, is gonna bring a little bit of the peritoneum along with it. Now that's not a problem, as long as the peritoneum that it brings along with it doesn't have any small or large intestine. Sometimes babies are born with congenital inguinal hernias, especially obviously male babies. Well, with male babies, the reason why you, you can be born with it is because as the testes descend forward, they go forward, then medial and inferior, it brings a little bit of the peritoneum along with it. As long as there's no small or large intestines in there, that's fine, right? That's actually gonna become the tunica vaginalis region. So that's fine. The problem becomes if there's a little bit of small intestine that goes with it. If you have a little intestine that goes with it, now you have a congenital inguinal hernia and some babies need to have surgery done to fix it. Remember, hernias by themselves innately aren't that dangerous. The problem with hernias is that they can become strangulated and the blood vessels then will cut off the supply to the small or large intestine that's part of our hernia. When that happens, that's immediate life-threatening condition. That's one of the reasons why we want to get this fixed, especially congenital ones, pretty early in life. Now, in terms of descendant testes, we kind of mentioned the gobanaculum. One of the things that does happen is as the testes descend from the abdominal cavity into the scrotal swelling, they go through a region that we call the inguinal canal. Now the inguinal canal is a region between your mons pubis or your, you know, even better yet, your pubic symphysis and your superior anterior iliac spine. So the superior anterior iliac spine is the bump we feel right at the very start of our hip region anteriorly. So that's that bump that, you know, if you ever seen male models that are super thin, 
female models that are super thin, you can actually see the prominence of that anterior superior iliac spine. Well, there's a little bit of a canal that's found between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic symphysis on each side. It forms a V, in other words. Well, that inguinal canal is gonna be the pathway for the testes to descend into the scrotal swelling. Now, because we have a canal there, there's a weakness inherently there in terms of all males, increasing the probability that all males might have inguinal hernias later on in life. That doesn't mean that you know every male is gonna have it, I'm just saying that because of this inguinal ring and inguinal canal, there's a slight weakness in the inferior margin of our abdomen that allows for the fact that a little bit of small intestine can guide their way through, and now you have an inguinal hernia. Uh, Cryptoorchidism is a failure of one testes to descend. Now, this should make sense why there's such a huge difference in terms of the incidence of cryptoorchidism. For the incidence right here, I want you to know just how much larger the incidence is between a full-term baby and a preemie. Now let's take a look back here and even over here in this slide. <clears throat> Remember, at about eight weeks, testes is up high, especially when we're mentioning this is a fetus right here. Now, as we move down, it moves down slightly at the end of the first trimester, and then, right, at seven and eight months right here, and this picture shows it a little bit better, at seven and eight months in gestation, the testes has moved down all the way into the scrotal swelling. Why is this important? Simple. What happens if you have a, a baby that's born seven and a half months? And that does happen now more often because we're seeing more triplets, twins, quads, right? because of all the fertilization techniques we have now. Well, what happens is if you have a premature baby and they're born at seven months of age instead of nine or 10 months, what we'll see is that the testes might not have had the time to fully descend yet. So if you're born at seven months, well, we know that between that time period, you should have the testes move into the scrotum, but everybody's different. So you might have, or your son, or your, all right, your nephew, or your brother might have been born at seven months, seven and a half months, and the testes hasn't fully descended yet. And what we're saying here is that because premature babies are born prematurely, the testes might not have had time to fully descend. That's why there's such a large incident increase between the two. Now keep in mind, usually, 80% of the time, the testes will spontaneously descend. The other 20% of the time, we try as quickly within the first year, year and a half of life to do surgical intervention. So then we can either remove the testes or bring it down to its normal position. And usually we will remove it uh, even at any age. If we know that you have uh, one testes that didn't fully descend, we will try to get in there and remove it. The reason why is that if the testes and obviously the fallopian, the fallopian, uh, the vas deferens and everything stays in the abdominal cavity, there's a greater likelihood of cancers. So we wanna remove the testes, even though we know it's no longer viable. Now, in terms of cells found in the scrotum and in the testes. So now we're talking about specifically the testes and how sperm development occurs. I'm gonna to move to this side right here. And again, uh, in our lecture, in our class yesterday on Wednesday, I drew something similar to this. Obviously, I'm not a good artist, so I just wrote down hypothalamus, pituitary, things like that. Uh, keep in mind, this is an anterior pituitary gland. You have to keep that always in mind, not the posterior. So what happens? Now, if we look at maybe a six, seven-year-old girl and we compare that girl with a six, seven-year-old boy, morphologically, just by look, they look very similar, right? So sometimes it's actually hard to tell if a boy with long hair is a boy or a girl. 
Why? It's because the, their body shapes are very similar at that point. The reason why is because for males, no testosterone release yet, right? Testosterone will be released at puberty. Now, the weird thing is this, there's also a small batch of testosterone that gets released really early on in gestation, but between gestation and puberty, there are very, very low levels of testosterone found in the male body. So what we see is that the male and female kids that are under the age of seven to eight, they look very similar. Now, girls develop a little earlier, so the estrogen release occurs a little bit earlier at about nine, 10, maybe even, you know, nowadays, 10, 11 years of age, you're going to start seeing the big difference, right, in the ways boys look and the ways the girls look. Now, what happens with boys at puberty? Number one, keep in mind, no testosterone, right, or very, very, very little levels of testosterone since birth. When that happens, the testes haven't had time to fully develop, meaning that there are no sperm cells found in the testes. But also keep in mind that we have stem cells already found there, stem cells that will become sperm. What we call these stem cells are spermatogonia. Spermatogonia. These are the stem cells. And I do want you to know the name. So the spermatogonia are the stem cells that allows us to undergo meiosis and then form four daughter sperm cells out of it. So I'm gonna just highlight some of these so then you guys, so you know that I want you to know what they are. So keep in mind, know what spermatogonia are, know what secondary spermatocytes are. And then what are spermatotids? Now, we'll talk about these cells as well. <clears throat> and I have slides just specifically about Sertoli, Sustenticular, i.e. nerve cells. I know there's three different names for these same cells, right? We'll talk about what they are. Now, interstitial cells are also called Leydig cells. So all of these cells have two names. I want you to know their names because you'll never know which version that you'll encounter in your school career. So you need to know the names here. Now, what happens at birth? And even better, right? What happens at puberty? At birth, up until puberty, none of these hormones get released yet. Instead, we're gonna have those spermatogonia. Those spermatogonia are stem cells and they're found in the lobule of your testes. So they're found, they're already present there and they're present and all they're doing is waiting until you hit puberty. At puberty, the hypothalamus releases GnRH. So right here, you have the hypothalamus releasing GnRH. The GnRH is called gonadotropin releasing hormone. Gonadotropins, anytime you hear the word tropin, that means activator. It causes growth, right? Anabolic steroids are huge tropins that cause growth of the muscle that they're supposed to increase the viability of. So whenever you hear a gonadotropin, it's going to cause growth of the gonads. The gonads in the male are the testes. So what we're gonna do is, uh, with GnRH is gonna cause, is release a hormone, GnRH, it's gonna go into the pituitary gland, anterior pituitary gland. And the GnRH is gonna cause a release of our gonadotropins. The gonadotropins are LH and FSH. LH is luteinizing hormone. FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. Now the names here of these hormones were first found in females and then we found it later in males, but it was too late to change the names. So we don't have follicles in the males. We don't have any uh, corpus luteum in the males, but we have the same hormones and they were already named by the time we found them in the male body. So again, at puberty, hypothalamus releases GnRH, which causes your anterior pituitary gland to release LH and FSH. LH and FSH, they are your gonadotropins. They're gonna stimulate your gonads. The FSH is gonna go into the gonads, your testes, and activate our sustenticular cells. And again, Sertoli cells 
are also known as sustenticular cells. They're also known as nurse cells. The reason why they're known as nurse cells is because these cells, sustenticular nurse cells, are going to be the ones that guides meiosis. That's going to be the ones that help the sperm cells develop. Now, LH is going to go into the testes and work on a second category of cells, our interstitial cells. Interstitial cells, again, are also known as Leydig cells. So LH is going to cause those interstitial cells to release testosterone. Now you have our first batch of testosterone release at puberty. Sustenticular cells activated by FSH causes the formation of androgen binding protein. You need the androgen binding protein and the testosterone to work for you to stimulate spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis is going to stimulate meiosis from our spermatogonia. As you take that spermatogonia and have it undergo the meiotic cycles, we're gonna see that we're gonna form sperm out of meiosis. So in order to form that viable sperm, we need a combination of the testosterone, which is activated by the Leydig cells or interstitial cells under the presence of LH. And <clears throat> we're going to require androgen binding protein. Testosterone is a type of androgen. So androgen binding protein is gonna attach itself to the cells. It's gonna then allow testosterone to work and activate spermatogenesis and meiosis will occur and you're gonna form four sperm cells. Now, in the meantime, you don't ever wanna over overproduce testosterone. If you do, you're gonna have huge effects of you know, <clears throat> irritability, uh, a whole set of other conditions we'd see with people that are taking anabolic steroids. Now, what this testosterone release does though at puberty, it allows the male secondary sexual characteristics to be seen, including the male pattern growth of hair, including the increased muscular build of the muscles of the body, <clears throat> right? Including the deepening of the voice. All of that is due to the release of testosterone at puberty. Now, testosterone also activates the libido. So then you have an increased sex drive. Remember, everything here is to increase the probability of having a baby. So if you have all these this testosterone and you have all this sperm being formed, what good is it if you don't have a sex drive, right? So you need that increased libido as well. And that is what testosterone allows us to do. Now, testosterone though has a huge effect and has a negative feedback effect on LH, FSH, and GNRH. The more testosterone gets released, the, the more inhibition of GNRH, and then there's less release of FSH and LH. So just keep that in mind is that there's a negative feedback loop and that negative feedback loop allows us and prevents us from overproducing sperm cells. Remember, sperm formation requires a lot of energy. So our body hates wasting energy for no reason at all. This is also the reason why people on anabolic steroids will see the testes shrivel up. It's one of the things that we tell you know, high school students, hopefully to, I hate to say shame them, but to shame them so then they don't you know, try anabolic steroids. So what does the effect of anabolic steroids, how does that affect the testes then? Simple, when you're giving somebody anabolic steroids, you're giving them exogenous forms of testosterone. Exogenous means an outside source, right? So you're giving them testosterone, different types of testosterone that is from an outside source compared to from an inside source like our body. So that exogenous testosterone that we introduce to the body increases our total testosterone levels. What happens then? If we have so much testosterone, it's gonna have a negative feedback effect. It's gonna stop all GNRH from being released in that time period. No more LH, no more FSH. Then what happens? No more stimulation of the testes. The testes 
that will atrophy because you no longer give it the hormones required for it to grow, for it to do its job, right? Without LH and FSH, testes shrivel up and they get smaller. This is why when you take steroids, anabolic steroids, you do have the shriveling effect of the testes that is seen. It's because you're giving that person different forms of testosterone, some more potent than the testosterone found naturally occurring in our body. The high testosterone levels then will inhibit GnRH release, which inhibits LH and FSH release. When both LH and FSH are no longer released, you're no longer activating the testes. The testes then shuts down and atrophies. Perfect. That's how we develop that kind of you know, shrinking effect on the testes from taking anabolic steroids. Now, I'm not gonna talk too much about meiosis in this section, in this la uh, lecture, just because I put in a lot of yesterday and I do have a video that discusses it as well. Now, remember, I will talk a little bit about it, specifically things that make meiosis different in males and females. And you know, with the video, I do want you to watch these videos, right? Undergo these, what cells undergo meiosis, compared to mitosis. Differences between meiosis and mitosis. What is crossing over? When does it happen? What happens in crossing over, right? And then differences between males and females in meiosis. Now, in terms of the actual exam, these are the type of questions I would ask on an actual exam. What I would ask in a quiz is more specifically what happens in the phases of mitosis. What happens in meiosis, in, you know, in meiosis, not mitosis. What happens in meiosis, phase, uh, prophase. What happens in meiosis, metaphase, right? That kind of stuff. So just keep that in mind. We will have a more defined quiz on meiosis. And it's gonna be very similar to the quiz I released for aerobic respiration. Here, we're gonna talk in terms of the quiz. The quiz will be more focused on the stages than the exam where I want you to know big picture stuff, right? Why do these cells undergo meiosis? Why do other cells undergo mitosis? So those are the big picture questions I would ask like this right here for the test versus a quiz. Now, again, right, we will have to talk about it a little bit just so we can encounter how sperm cells are produced here. Spermatogenesis triggered at puberty by the release of testosterone. That spermatogenesis causes our stem cell, spermatogonia right here, to undergo mitosis first. Yes, you heard that right. You undergo mitosis first. And this should make sense why, right? The reason why is simple. Right? When we undergo mitosis, you form two identical stem cells. One stem cell stays a stem cell so then it can be further used later on. One of the stem cells then will undergo meiosis. Again, you, all right, when we want spermatogenesis to occur, our, stem, our spermatogonia stem cell undergoes mitosis at first. By undergoing mitosis, we always have a population of stem cells that we can use later to make more sperm later on. One of the stem cells that we produce will then undergo meiosis and form sperm. The other one stays a stem cell until you need it later. Let's say a month later, you need more sperm. Well, this stem cell, the other spermatogonia, undergo mitosis again, one stays a stem cell, one turns into sperm. We never then deplete our amount of spermatogonia, right? This allows us to produce sperm indefinitely up until, and you guys have probably watched and heard news of, you know, rich people that are 70, 80 years old, uh, athletes, uh, even rich businessmen. They're 70, 80 years old, and they have a baby with a 25, 30 year old. It's kind of gross, but it does happen. The reason why they can have the baby is because even at that age, you're still producing sperm. You still have stem cells to produce even more sperm later on. So 
that does happen. We do have that first mitotic division producing a daughter stem cell that will then undergo meiosis. Before this daughter cell undergoes meiosis, it's going to go through the cell life cycle and it's gonna have DNA replication. So right here, when the daughter cell turns into a primary spermatocyte, it undergoes the cell life cycle, remember G1, S, G2, right? So as it goes G1, it increases the number of DNA nucleotides. It increases the number of you know, energy ATP. So then it can go into the S phase, right? The S phase then is gonna be where we have DNA replication. So then we double the DNA. Now take a look though. We have 46 chromosomes and then we double it here and we still have 46 chromosomes. Why is that? Simple. When we have DNA replication here, what we will see is that we're adding a second arm, a second version that is identical to the previous version. And since the two chromosomes are attached to each other, it's going to count as only one. So when you look at this right here and see 46 chromosomes, that's 46 double arm chromosomes with each arm containing enough genetic material for one chromosome. So you have two arms, they're attached to each other. Each arm has a genetic material for one chromosome. So you should have two chromosomes. The thing is when they're attached, they only count as one. So here, 46 chromosomes, yes, they're 46 chromosomes, but they're 46 dual armed chromosomes like we see here. The 46 dual armed chromosomes in your head right now, I want you to think that's actually 92 chromosomes. And as soon as we separate it, it's 92 chromosomes. But since they're attached, it only counts as 46. Weird, right? So here are the 46 chromosomes. At the start of meiosis, it's 46 single uh, double arm chromosomes. So in your head, 92 chromosomes right now. Perfect. We'd undergo the first meiotic division. During the first meiotic division, like I mentioned, we have a lab video, a lecture video about meiosis uh, specifically. So watch those because I'm going to go through this kind of fast. During the first meiotic division, in between prophase and metaphase, you have the chromosomes, the double arm chromosomes lined up next to each other. And what happens is as they line up next to each other, right here, all of mom's chromosome number ones, the two copies, all of dad's chromosome number ones, all of mom's chromosome number twos, all of dad's chromosome number twos, they're all gonna line up so closely that there can be a little bit of a genetic exchange. So a little bit of mom's chromosome number one right here can get transferred to dad's chromosome. So then now what we're gonna see is that dad's chromosome number one over here on this side, right? A lot of it's gonna be his and then a little bit of a speck of mom's. And then dad's chromosome number one goes to mom. So then there's a rough equivalent crossing over effect where genetic information is exchanged between the chromosomes. What happens then? All the homologous chromosomes line up next to each other and gets pulled to the sides in anaphase right here. Now keep in mind right here, these are double arm chromosomes. So they have the genetic material for two chromosomes, right? Here we should have four total chromosome ones right here. The two from mom with a little bit of dad's, the two from dad with a little bit of mom's, right? So just keep that in mind. Then what happens, right? After cell, the first cell division, we might have recombination where you have that crossing over effect and a little bit of dad's chromosome goes on mom, a little mom's chromosome goes on dad's, right? That's good. It's gonna give us genetic variation. So then our kids don't look identical to each other, right? It gives us genetic variation. So then maybe your daughter is gonna have grandpa's eyes, right? Is gonna have grandma's mouth, right? That kind of stuff it gives us the ability to look slightly different. Now, in terms of secondary spermatocytes, these secondary spermatocytes are formed after our first meiotic division. You have 23 chromosomes after that first meiotic division. 
Keep in mind though, you have 23 double arm chromosomes right here for each cell here. Because there are 23 double arm chromosomes, you actually have 46 chromosomes, right? They're only considered 23 chromosomes because they're attached to each other. Once you physically separate it, they're separate chromosomes again. So these 23 right here is 23 double arm chromosomes. And then you undergo the second meiotic division for each of the cells you just produced. And as you produce them, now we produce 23 chromosome sperm cells. Perfect. This is exactly what we want. We have 23 chromosomes on the sperm cells, 23 from the egg. Now we have the two sets of 23 from each parent that we see in our cells. Now, with the second meiotic division, what happens now is that every single, if we have crossing over, right, what we will see is that these cells are all genetically different to each other. Perfect. Genetic variance is very important, right? Again, I'll mention again, one of the differences between meiosis and mitosis is that by the end of the effect, by the end of the cycle here of cell division, in meiosis, you have four daughter cells that are all non-identical because of crossing over. They're definitely not the same as the parent cell. In mitosis, when we reproduce right here, we produce only two daughter cells, but the two daughter cells should be identical to each other and the parent. So that's completely different, right? Even the numbers are different. Again, as they're undergoing this meiotic division, that happens under the guidance of our, the sustenticular cells. So we say the sustenticular Sertoli cells, they also are called nurse cells. It makes sense why they're called nurse cells. They're called nurse cells because they're guiding meiosis. They are the actual cells that allows meiosis to occur between the cells, between them and other nurse cells. So they're keeping that structure. So then meiosis, remember, it's gonna take a little bit of time to undergo the first meiotic division. It's gonna take a bit of time for the secondary spermatocyte to undergo the second meiotic division. If we didn't have these sustenticular nurse Sertoli cells, we would not be able to undergo meiosis. The daughter cells will undergo meiosis and they'll just fall right into the lumen without ever completing it. The presence of these cells allows time. So then the cells, the primary spermatocyte, it can undergo meiosis without falling into the lumen. The secondary spermatocytes can undergo my meiosis too without it falling into lumen. Then you can form the spermatotids and the spermatotids can become viable sperm without falling, right? So why we call it nurse cell, very similar to what a nurse does, right? A nurse is gonna help guide and make you better, giving you time to get better. And this is what we're seeing here. Now, this is what the, a cut of our seminiferous tubules looks like. The seminiferous tubules, and you see lots of these weird looking nuclei that are huge. These big nuclei right here are the nucleus. You can start seeing a lot of genetic material, a lot of chromosomes. That's a sign that these primary spermatocytes are undergoing meiosis, right? These are the Sertoli nerve cells that form the structure. So then meiosis can occur without the cell falling right into the lumen and getting sucked away, right? So just keep that in mind. There's, you know, the Sertoli cells are guiding meiosis, allowing it to happen. So then the cells have time to split, then those cells have time to split before it's moved into the lumen. Without the nurse cells, you're gonna have primary spermatocytes form and they'll get shoved right into the lumen without ever undergoing meiosis. Now, the Leydig cells are found outside of the seminiferous tubules. That's what we call them interstitial cells. And those cells are going to produce testosterone, which then allows us to form and activate meiosis. Right, let me 